Good morning and welcome to this special Resurrection Sunday gathering of our Bridge family. Wherever you are, whatever time of day or night it is, know that we welcome you and we're blessed to be together as one family with one faith and one focus as we come today to celebrate all that we have in a living Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, friends, before we pray, let me ask you a question that can perhaps bring us all together as we start today. I'd like to ask you something very personal. What are you thinking right now? What are you thinking right now? In fact, how are you feeling right now? Is there anything troubling you? Are you focused? Are you distracted? What are you thinking and how are you feeling right now? Let me press in a little further. What are you expecting in the next few minutes? What are you expecting over the next hour or so? I wonder if you've ever taken the time to think that through in the context that we are now in. Let, let me explain what I mean. We all know, no doubt, that we're gathered here. It's what most of the world would call Easter Sunday. I wonder, have you focused in on what this gathering means, what this celebration means? How much time have you spent thinking about what Easter means? How are you feeling in regards to Easter? Let me ask you a question that's not going to seem to make much sense right now, but it will momentarily. How much time have you spent thinking about Christmas this morning over the last couple of days? As we've had Easter Resurrection Sunday coming, how much time have you spent thinking about Christmas and the coming of Christ? It's a lot to take in here, but let me remind you, or for those that haven't been with us, let me just give you an update on where we're at and where our time will be today. We've been focusing since the beginning of the year on the Gospel of Matthew. We've up to this point covered chapter one in the Gospel of Matthew, and today we're going to crack into chapter two. We're going to have as a text Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. But you'll see, I'm going to key in on one verse. And I pray, give you a perspective, something to think about, to take with you. Not just for this Resurrection Sunday, but for what I pray will be the rest of your life. You see, in our opening of Matthew's Gospel in chapter 1, we've seen already that we're dealing with God's recorded history we have the opening two words, Biblos Genesis, the book of recordings, the Bible of the beginning, for the one who has no beginning and no end. We went from that introduction to looking at the genealogy of Jesus, and we saw there's so much theology in the genealogy that we could literally spend countless amounts of weeks and time unpacking that. But then we moved on from the genealogy of Jesus to the foretelling and the describing of his coming. And we ended chapter one with the announcement of the birth of Christ. Well, we're going to move now into chapter two, and I pray you're going to see what will hopefully give you perspective and blessing. You see, today's title of this Resurrection Sunday service is Easter's Troubling Truth. Easter's Troubling Truth. Now, I wonder, when you think back to my opening question, how many of us have come in troubled? How many of us are wrestling with troubling truth this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday? How much of that is internal troubling? How much of it is external troubling? And how much of it is eternal troubling? I want you to 
Pray with me and ask God to tenderize us and prepare us for what he'll show us today. Lord, we come to you now and on behalf of each one that's about to hear your word, I pray that we will all heed your word. Show us your truth and love. Show us today's troubling truth and help all of us get to the place <clears throat> where we are in a healthy, holy relationship with you, the truth, with your truth and all that this day represents. I pray it now in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, by way of preview, we're going to look at three points. Today's troubling truth. We'll take a look at today and bring us into what I'm calling a resurrection contextualization, understanding what today really means and what it is. And then we're going to look at the text, the scripture, a little closer. Again, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And then we'll come back to this troubling truth in a way that I pray will bless you and help to build you up to the glory of God. So before we get into today's meaning, let's go to the text. If you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, I want you to come with me. Let's read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to take my time and point some things out to you because we won't be coming back to the text specifically, but we will be referencing and unpacking the text with the rest of our time. So if you would come with me, he, uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. God's word says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, now, after. So we're now speaking after the birth. Notice, we're now speaking about the beginning of the life of Christ. And we're being told, and this is very important, it's in the time of Herod the king. Herod the king. The man who Rome appointed as the localized king of the Jews. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, okay, behold, watch this, wise men or magi from the east came to Jerusalem. So here in verse one, we've just set the stage. We know that it's now during the time of the beginning life of Jesus. It's during the time of Herod the king. And remember, Matthew's point is to show us that Jesus is king. It was Matthew who was showing us in chapter 1 that this is the son of David. This is the king who was promised, this Jesus who is coming. This is the one who comes from the line of Abraham. This is the one who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Notice a contrast. We've been told about the coming King Jesus, but now he's in contrast to Herod the king. And these wise men, I want you to see part of the troubling that I hope to unpack, although we won't get into the depths of it, is the troubling that comes with a sense of tradition that can be very misleading. See, these wise men, these magi, they were from the east and they came to Jerusalem. We often sing a song around Christmas, the three kings, these three kings of Orient are. Well, let me just point out and send you to the notes. You'll find a ton of research and study. These men are not kings, and they're not from the Orient. What Scripture tells us is that they were considered wise men or magi. They were a cross between astrologers, between uh, serving as religious leaders. They were often called the kingmakers because they would be used by many of the kings to get insights into what they thought was divine revelation. Now, interestingly enough, Daniel, Daniel from our Bible, the Old Testament prophet Daniel, he was the head of the Magi in Nebuchadnezzar's court. And then as Nebuchadnezzar fell, he continued on as the head Magi. So there's a connection here that most people don't realize. These wise men, these Magi, 
they most likely were trained up and heard of the prophecies of Daniel. They are probably, while not Jews and not believers in the God of the Bible, they had most likely heard of and were referencing and pursuing more knowledge about what had been prophesied through Daniel. We can see this again as we go deeper into the notes. But the Magi are not the point. The Messiah is the point. So let's go on. They came to Jerusalem saying, where is he? So now these Magi have come to Jerusalem and they're asking, where is he who was born, born king of the Jews? Note the question. Everything is here. These Magi came to Jerusalem, that's the capital, and they're asking the king, Herod, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Now, note, they're asking the question of the Roman official who was appointed king of the Jews. And notice again, they're not asking, where is the one who was born to become the king of the Jews? No, it wasn't a future statement. It was, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? That's huge because it gives us a sense of context for what we're about to see happen through this evil King Herod. For we saw his star. These magi say, we know he was born because we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. We didn't come to worship you, Herod. We didn't come to worship anybody else. We came to worship that one who the star in the sky showed us was the king of the Jews. He's been born. We've come to worship him. Where is he? This is huge. Matthew, per the inspiration of our Lord, is establishing the fact that Jesus was born king. That's the big idea. The trouble is, Christ is born, was born king. He is king. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. This is verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. This is our focus for today. He was troubled. Notice, comma and all Jerusalem with him. King Herod was troubled, and all of Jerusalem as well. Friend, I want to ask you, do you understand Easter's troubling truth? When you look at the coming of Christ, now in the context of Resurrection Sunday, does that trouble you? You see, this truth was troubling to King Herod and all who were in Jerusalem. Why? Listen to verse 4. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, Herod inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And then he goes to reference Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Quote, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler, a king, who will shepherd my people Israel. That was verse 6. Verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly. So once Herod knew where Christ, the king of the Jews, would be born in Bethlehem, he now calls for the Magi to come back. And he says to them, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. So now Herod the king knows where Christ will be born, and he figures out from the magi and the timing of the star about how long it has been. And here again, our tradition places the wise men at the manger. The reality is, as ascertained here through Herod's deduction, Jesus at this point is upwards of two years old. We know that because Herod's going to seek to kill every boy child two years and younger in this region. So the reality is Jesus is probably upwards of two years old at this point. 
And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, so Herod sends the Magi to Bethlehem and he says to them, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I too may come and worship him. See the evil, wicked King Herod. He's saying, hey, let me know because I want to come and worship him too. This is now the second time we've heard this word worship. The Magi said we want to go and worship him. Now we have the lying King Herod who wants to kill this competing King Jesus. He says, oh yes, let me know because I want to come worship too. Don't miss the spiritual warfare, the deception, the things that we see all around us all the time. The reality is right here in this micro portion. Verse 9, after listening to the king, the Magi went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it had risen went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. I want to point out here the miraculous. Notice there's a troubling reality in that God and his miraculous work leading the Magi. Here again now a star, and we don't know what this is. The reality is God doesn't want us to have the kind of specificity that we'd like. Chances are it's not what we would consider to be a star in the sky because while that could lead them from the east to Jerusalem, it wouldn't lead them right to the house. Some think it was perhaps an angel of the Lord. Others would say it's just some form of a miraculous sign that Matthew identified as a star because there perhaps is no better word to use. All we know is that God miraculously guided these magi specifically to the house. Notice it's not the manger. We now have Mary and Joseph in a house. Again, showing us that time has elapsed. Things have progressed. And these magi, now we go to verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Note, third time, worship. They worshiped him. And notice here for our Catholic friends, they didn't worship Mary. They worshiped him and him alone. No mention of Joseph, no reference to Mary. They worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and mirth. Now, we often hear about the three kings or the three wise men. The reality is we don't know how many there were. And tradition has placed three because of the three gifts. But the reality is, culture would say, there was probably a very, very large number. Uh, and they would have had a huge entourage. These wise men would have traveled like large government officials. They would have traveled likely from Babylon, perhaps in Persia. Most likely they traveled for months. They had these incredibly expensive gifts they would have more than likely had a large military presence with them. That would help to explain in part chapter 3 when Herod was troubled and all the people in Jerusalem were troubled. We're going to camp on that troubled verse 3 here in a minute. But let's just close out this passage, verse 12. And being warned in a dream, get this, being warned in a dream. So again, God is speaking to his representative people. We don't even necessarily know that these three wise men or these countless wise men were believers. The fact that they worshiped could have just been that they were showing honor and reverence to the localized kings. So they may have worshiped the way we think and the, the way they should, but they may have just been showing honor. But notice here, God sends them a warning per a dream. God speaks to his people. I say this emphatically because there is a heresy afoot that thinks that if you don't have a chapter and a verse, you can't have heard from God, and that's heresy. God speaks to his people the way he chooses to speak to his people, and it's God's word that reaffirms that and tells us that over and over and over again. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Friends, I pray that you see here that God is doing a work in the coming of Christ that we see culminating today in the celebration of the resurrection of Christ. 
He was born king. We've come to see and worship the one who was born king of the Jews. Now, if you don't understand what happened at his coming, you won't fully or properly understand what is happening here when he was crucified on Friday and when he's resurrected here on Sunday. Let me show you a compilation, something pulled together that's designed to give you and me a clear biblical contextualization of the resurrection of Christ. And I pray in pulling this together, it will help to bless and build you up. And then we'll come back and we'll take a closer look at verse 3 and how and why Herod the king and all in Jerusalem were troubled by the coming of Christ. Watch this, and then we'll get right back together. The garden is quiet, but with an uneasy anticipation. A man kneels beneath a canopy of trees, trembling in anguish. Less than a week ago, this man rode into Jerusalem, welcomed as a king. And on this night, that same crowd will demand his execution. But for now, it's quiet and fitting that at this pivotal moment, we find ourselves in a garden. The scene of the crime. All those ages ago, in that first garden, our ancestors, Adam and Eve, were given everything to enjoy and one simple boundary. Do not eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. And Satan, the serpent, seized the opportunity. With his poisonous words, he planted the seed of doubt. Does God really love you? Adam and Eve take the fruit, and as they eat, their hearts stand together in rebellion to their creator, saying, not your will, but ours be done. And that act of rebellion passed down through the ages, every generation carrying the seed of sin, every person guilty before the righteous judge, every person but one. This man, Jesus, who kneels in the garden, the cup of God's wrath, the penalty for our sin stands ready to be poured out on him. The serpent watches, the echoes of his lies ringing down through the ages. Does God really love you? A trembling voice breaks the silence as Jesus speaks. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. The serpent leans in. Can it be? Will the Son of God abandon his mission? Will this garden mark yet another victory for the evil one? Jesus lifts his head to heaven, and with his next words, both his fate and the serpent's are sealed. Not my will, but yours be done. And unlike every human being before or after, Jesus lays down his will before the Father. And in the distance, the glow of torches, Jesus is cast out of the garden. The spotless Lamb of God is led away to slaughter. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like Sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, 
his body stumbling and his spirits burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross. Feeling forsaken by his father. Left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has conquered. And Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard. And a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. Before the dawn of creation, there was the Word. Before the beginning had begun, before the planet spun and the sun hung in the sky, there was the Word. He was the light, and the light was alive, giving life to all things, everything. No thing was created except through Him. And in His image, He created them, us in his likeness to reflect the light and be just like him but sin came on the scene and everything went dark not even a spark left we were hard pressed for a savior he had offered us his love in exchange for our trust but we could not live up to his standard of perfection we were dejected broken hostile hopeless But this is the gospel we put our hope in, that God, in his endless wisdom, fashioned the word into flesh, and he pitched his tent in the midst of our mess, and the rest is history. The mystery of the cross, the incalculable cost of his life in exchange for our imperfection, the beauty of his resurrection, giving us life in exchange for his death when we call upon his name, Jesus giver of grace, purveyor of peace, master of mercy, the word, the one who bore the scars that we deserve. Have you heard the gospel, the good news, not what you can do for God, but what he has done for you. It is finished. God planned since before the beginning, the greatest story ever written, broken by sin, but restored when we surrender to the word. This is the gospel. Have you heard? Very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Suddenly, Two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them and said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen.
Why do you seek the living among the dead? A question that cuts right to the heart. That day, the women found an empty tomb that once held a crucified Christ. So the angels asked them this very profound question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? That same question echoes in our hearts today. Why do we seek life in things that lead to death? Why do we look for a savior in all the wrong places? We want to live life to the fullest, but we chase the things that ultimately kill us. Why do we search for fulfillment and emptiness? Why do we seek the living among the dead? But that same question contains a sense of celebration. The ultimate sacrifice of Jesus was successful. Death couldn't stop him, hell couldn't hold him, and sin couldn't beat him. Jesus died so that we could live. He took our place, accepting the death that we deserve so that we could live with him forever. Because of his sacrifice, our lives don't end with death. And now we can celebrate. Not because he was crucified, but because he rose. Not because he died, but because he lives. And when we gather together in his name, he is with us. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not there. He is here. Amen. I pray that you see from the before time began perspective that we have in the scriptures that tell us that all of what has happened from the fall of man to the crucifixion of Christ to the resurrection of our King, all of this has been a part of God's sovereign providential plan. And we know that he is risen. We celebrate today that he is risen. Why are people looking for the living amongst the dead? He's not there. He is here. He's with us. This is part of his promise at the close of the gospel. And I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, says Jesus. So let us know, let us remember, let us celebrate the reality of today's resurrection. And let us remember that the troubling that Herod had, the troubling that those in Jerusalem have, they're the same troubled problems that are all around us today. I want you to think about the troubled reality of mankind. Think about all that you and I are seeing in this world that is literally corrupt and it is chaotic, it is killing people, and there is eternal death in the mix. And unless we understand what is truly troubling about mankind and our collective problem, we're not going to be able to rightly and righteously celebrate what Christ accomplished. Because this truth and love of Easter, Resurrection Sunday, it's for those who understand our need for Christ to be our Lord, to be our Messiah, to be our Savior. I want you to see this from John MacArthur. I literally found this yesterday and it changed some of this sermon because I think this needs to be in here to help us to get a contextualization on the troubling truth that Easter represents. As we see our society falling apart around us, we have to ask ourselves, what is the common denominator that is causing all of this nonsense that we're seeing? The breakdown in social morality, the breakdown of law and order, what is really happening? Is this normal behavior that we are witnessing? We have to ask ourselves, what is causing this? What is the cause of this? Is it some sort of issue that is being brought upon man, or is it something from themselves? Mark 7, verse 20. Jesus was saying, that which proceeds out of the man That is what defiles the man. Now listen, you have to understand this. There's only two possibilities. We have a troubled world because something is being done to us from the outside, or we have a troubled world because something is wrong with us on the inside. The contemporary culture would say all that's wrong in the world is because somebody has been oppressed. 
All that's wrong in the world is because somebody has been treated with inequity. All that's wrong in the world is because somebody's not getting their fair shake. The Bible says what's wrong in the world is from the inside. There's only two possibilities. And the statement of verse 21 is clear. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed to evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Let me Just a few years ago, we witnessed riots all across the United States, and we were wondering, how could these people do what they were doing? The destruction, the lawlessness, the looting, we just were in shock just to see our own society falling away to the wayside as this kind of behavior was taking place. So what is the core issue? Everything you saw in the riots this summer was unrelated to anything on the outside. It was all a manifestation of the human heart. You can't fix the human heart in any other way than with a gospel transformation. You cannot blame all the crimes that were listed in what I just read you on something that happened to people. It's because of who you are on the inside. It, it really is a remarkable thing that we don't destroy each other more than we do. That, that how could this many people sit in a room for this long and not attack each other? <laughs> because the default position of humanity is hate. The default position of humanity is selfishness and pride. And when you kill true religion, you have to put something metaphysical in its place. And so you can invent a religion that would fit the culture. And so this culture loves to hate. So you invent CRT, critical race theory, which makes people noble when they hate the right group. It is of the utmost importance that you come to Christ and follow Him and live for Him during these times. Times are just going to continue to get worse. They're not going to get any better. You need to come to Christ if you are following Christ already and a true believer, praise the Lord for that. But you need to be still walking in truth, walking in light. You need to be walking upright. You need to be focused on God's Word, Scripture-driven life. You cannot be swayed by every little twist of the world what they're going to be throwing at you. They're coming at us very hard. So we have to stay strong and vigilant and just stay in God's Word and be guided properly. So we can get through these tough, difficult times until the Lord comes. All this nonsense about the fact that what's wrong with us is some social inequity doesn't get anywhere near the issue. What's wrong with us is we are wicked on the inside. And the default position of man is to do damage and sin. That's why the first commandment is to love God. And the second commandment is to love what? Your neighbor, because that is alien to the unconverted heart. It's hard to say amen, but when we know the truth about the risen king, we can say even in this context, in this Sodom and Gomorrah that we live in. I saw yesterday on Saturday, our White House, our president said that Easter Sunday would now be called Transgender Day. Unbelievable. We live in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's troubling. All of what's happening around us is troubling. The rejection of the miraculous work of God is troubling. The falsified fakes and phonies, the, the false teachers, the charlatans, it's all very troubling. The message that, hey, listen, you don't really have to be holy, just seek to be happy. The cheapening of grace, the doing things in ways that would appall the living God. All of these things are horrifying. They're troubling. But let me just show you, that's not just for the outside governmental or societal world. It's in the church as well. As we were 
in Africa just a couple of weeks ago in the small village of Luca, I met a pastor, Pastor Shadrach, who said to me one of his troubling challenges is that the church world has become corrupt, that they're all doing and saying things that go against God's word. I pray that you'll see that in every context, in every culture all over the world, we deal with the troubling realities of wrong messages and wrong methods, misrepresentation of our Messiah with the same response, truth and love, truth and love, truth and love. That's the best response to everything troubling. Let me show you what that looked like literally under the gathering tree in the small village of Luca. Pastor Shadrach, we are united because when you speak about the bridge message, but really it's the Bible's message. Only because so many say Bible, 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 but they're not telling the truth. We bring the truth and love, which is all from the Bible. The gathering does not make the church. The Being nice to each other doesn't make the church. It is the miracle of God's saving grace through Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to say something that many people don't like. The Catholic doctrine is not Christianity. There are many who gather in the church whose doctrine is not Christian. When the doctrine that is being taught goes against the gospel in the Bible, we have no fellowship. Now, Jesus put it this way. Goats and sheep. Sheep are the family. Goats go to hell. He says two important things to realize. They look very much like each other. Goats and sheep. That is Jesus' point. They look very close. And the second point. They are heaven and hell. And Jesus said, what does the light have to do with the darkness? Let me speak to my brother from the heart. That you will appreciate what maybe nobody else does. This problem of the disease, it goes forward. In many cases, because the pastors like you and me do not have the heart, or their stomach is not strong enough to swallow this food. Or their spine is not strong enough to stand under the weight. So when one who is not a Christian wants to have fellowship with the Christians, when their doctrine goes against the Bible, we tell them a few things. Number one, Jesus loves you and so do we. Notice love first. Next, we tell them we don't have the truth. We must give you the truth. And doctrine is what makes the difference in what we believe. Bad doctrine, bad belief. If I told you that I could stand on the top of the house, And I believe I can fly. 
It doesn't really matter what I believe. You would need, if you love me, to tell me, no, you cannot. We love people enough to risk them not liking them. We must learn what is the true gospel that makes the difference between heaven and hell. On these things we unite or we divide. And even when we divide, we stay loving. Now sometimes they're going to say, you're not being loving. But this is when we need the stomach and the spine. This is the gospel. This is Christianity. So who gathers under the tree together? Family of God. And we invite those who are not the family of God to come and seek. Amen. Amen. You see that smiling face with Pastor Shadrach. It was such a blessing to acknowledge that truth and love is the response to anything and everything troubling. We've seen this recently in our call to be Tituses, to embrace Titus 2.15, to declare that which is in accord with sound doctrine, to exhort and rebuke with all authority, letting no one disregard us. This is the truth. This is the troubling truth that Easter represents. When Christ was born, everyone that didn't want him or any form of a Messiah king that would take over their lives will be troubled. They were then, they are today. Anyone who does not accept that Christ is creator and over all creation is going to be troubled with his reality, especially his resurrection and his return. Those that don't accept that he is risen, they're going to be troubled with his presence. Those that don't want Jesus as their Lord, but only seek him as their Messiah or their Savior, as they say, they're going to be troubled. Every single one who demonstrates a resistance to his reigning power will be troubled by his wrath in the end. You see, friends, to understand the reality of Resurrection Sunday, to celebrate our time here on Easter, it's to know what it really means and who he really is and what he really did. We need more Friday in our Sunday, and we need to recognize that, yes, on Great Friday, we were looking forward to the coming Resurrection Sunday. Well, let me tell you, today's Resurrection Sunday and Monday's coming. Missional Monday's coming and we need to be ready. We need to be. I pray this quick reminder of the genuine reality of Easter will bless you and bring you back to this truth and love and away from those troubling deceptions of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The word Easter literally refers to the time of year in the spring when the days become longer than the nights. But for the person who knows Jesus Christ, Easter means a lot more than that. It means that even though Jesus died, salvation didn't. Even though Jesus was buried, hope wasn't. Because Jesus is alive. Easter means there is forgiveness for my failures, grace for my guilt, and mercy for my misery. Easter means that the pain and the silence of living in a Saturday world isn't purposeless and it isn't permanent. Easter means that I can't out the grace of God and I can't outrun the reach of God. It means that Jesus is King, light overcomes darkness, and justice will win, and brokenness will be broken. Easter means that the scars on the hands of Jesus are telling a story of victory, not defeat. And the same is true for me. It means that I am not alone, not ashamed, not forgotten, and not forsaken. It means that the rain and the storms and the wind and the waves of this world will not have the last word because my future is a resurrected body with the resurrected Jesus on a resurrected earth. Easter means that I can join with a choir of saints and angels singing, Oh death, where is your victory? Oh grave, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your song? Easter means that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for me. Easter means that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me.
Amen. I pray the true Easter is what is blessing you. I pray that's what you came looking for. If you came looking for peace lilies and Easter eggs and bunnies, well, I pray that you realize there's no place for that. That would be a very troubling set of expectations. Let the troubling of Easter be left with Satan and his minions. May they be troubled with the risen king. May they be troubled by the genuine biblical witness of the family of God. May the trouble lie on the side of the unrighteous. May those who detract and seek to deceive and divide and destroy, may they be the ones that are troubled because our living and loving king and his family are going to roll on because that's what he said, that's what he promised, that's what he empowered, and that's who we have been called, created, commanded, and commissioned to be. Amen. That's the call of our king, and that's who he wants us all to be. Oh, Lord, I pray that each one within the sound of my voice will recognize that you were born king, king of kings and Lord of lords. You didn't come to become king. You came as king and that you are the creator of all. You are the sustainer of all. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. You are the risen, loving, and living king. Amen. Lord, may this closing inspirational battle cry and then the two songs that remind us of your truth and love, may they come with us, not just through the rest of this day, but every single day for the rest of our lives. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray, believe, worship, and praise. Amen and amen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is lighter. 
I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king! That's my king!